Hi there, I'm Wendy McCallum, burnout and alcohol coach and wellness expert, and you're listening to Bite Size Balance, where everyday extraordinary women share their stories, expertise, and wisdom, all in the name of lifting each other up and creating a better life by design. Whether it's wellness, career, relationships, food, alcohol, mindfulness, hormones, or parenting, we talk about all things women's balance. If your life looks great on paper, but it still feels like something's missing, you're in the right place. Welcome to Bite Size Balance. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Bite Size Balance. I have a really special guest with me today. Um, Karen Furneau is here. Hey, Karen. Hi, Wendy. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm well, thank you. So nice to see you. I am so excited for this conversation. I want to tell everybody about you before we get started. So Karen is my first Olympian, maybe my last. (laughs) First of many. (laughs) Yeah, hopefully. And not just a one-time Olympian. Karen Furneau is a three-time Olympian and a two-time world champion and the winner of nine medals at the World Championships over her 20 year professional sprint kayaking career. She's the founder of I Promise Performance, and through her business, she speaks with audiences about the connection between health, mindset, and performance, which we're going to talk about today. Karen is also a published author. Uh, Her book, Strong Beauty Power Up the Champion Within, encourages youth to set goals and gives tools and best practices to achieve their dreams. Karen's done broadcast work with CBC as an analyst and has been part of the Olympic broadcast teams at both the Rio and Tokyo Olympics. Her former, her formal training includes a master's of science degree from Dalhousie in kinesiology with a specialization in sports psychology. And she has multiple certifications, including uh, team and leadership training through Cornell University. Karen is an inductee into the Nova Scotia Sport Hall of Fame and one of the top 15 most successful athletes in Nova Scotia sport history. And also an honorary Lieutenant Colonel with the Canadian Armed Forces Military Police. Um, and volunteers her time with the three MP regiment and military cadet teams. Holy cow, Karen. Karen is also <laughs> Karen is most passionate about engaging and empowering youth, donating her time to the Kids Help Phone and the Nova Scotia Sport Hall of Fame education program. Um, so that is an amazing bio. And I'm so excited that you agreed to come on this podcast, Karen. We met each other. We were trying to figure it out before we started recording today, probably like six years ago through a mutual friend. Um, But the circumstances, I guess, you know, COVID and everything else, like, I don't think I've laid eyes on you in person since that meeting, although we have stayed connected over social media. Um, And I don't know when it was, maybe a couple months ago, I, I posted something about the role of alcohol in the wellness industry. And you sent me a private message on that. And we started talking and I got up the guts to ask you if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast. And you said, yes. So yay. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh my gosh. It's totally my pleasure. We have so much to talk about. So, you know, I'm going to try to um, keep it streamlined, which I'm just so you know, full disclosure, not very good at. So we'll probably get completely off track, but I think it's <laughs> going to be a really interesting conversation because you're doing so many cool things now and you have done so many incredible things. So I maybe want to start with, you know, where everyone probably wants me to start, which is, I'd, I'd love it if you just take a few minutes. I know you get asked this all the time, but I've never had you on my podcast. So I'm going to ask you anyway, just tell me what was the most special, if you can, and it's probably not one thing, but that's okay. We have time. T- tell me about that Olympic experience and what it was like for you and that, how that changed you to, to go and compete at those games. Yeah. Thank you so much for the question. And I, I always love answering this because I do have a specific moment. Um, I remember walking into the opening ceremony into that huge stadium at my first Olympic games, which was Sydney in 2000 and uh, going through the tunnel, there's like a tunnel of concrete that, you know, as you enter this huge massive stadium. And uh, I remember the Canadian team, um, we just kind of all got together and we started chanting, you know, give me a C, give me an A, give me an N, like Canada. Mm -hmm. And then we marched into that uh, 400 meter track um, of the, the Olympic stadium. And we were greeted with, 60,000 fans of the Olympic movement who were all in attendance and they were holding these beautiful gold flags. And I remember just feeling warm. I felt held. I felt 
um, really special to be part of that moment. And, and it was really, you know, I'm, I'm sure every single person in that stadium felt something special. It was just this, this vibrancy, this connectivity, this, this peace um, and warmth. And it was, it was so uh, meaningful to me. And then it was so crazy. I actually saw my parents um, in those stands. Now I kind of knew where they would be generally, but 60,000 people, it's not really automatic that you would pick them out of a crowd of that size. And I, I mean, my mom and dad, they were jumping up and down and probably like, you know, making a big scene, but so was everyone else. But I connected with them in that moment. And it was so, so special. Wow. I just got chills when you were telling that story. So I can only imagine what it'd be like mm -hmm. to be there and be the center of all of that. That's incredible. Um, and and here's a question that I've been thinking of since you agreed to come on the podcast. I've been thinking about my own significantly lesser experiences when it comes to achievement and how hard I have found the transition from those into something else. So, you know, um, you know, I was a lawyer for a long time and I achieved, you know, kind of objective success in that career. I wasn't happy, so I didn't feel particularly personally successful, but definitely knew that other people saw me as successful and I'd gotten to a partnership level and been there for about four or five years when I decided I needed to leave. And, um, it was a really great decision for me and I don't regret it at all, but I do remember the after and feeling very empty and lost and bored, like just bored and trying to figure, and I was with my, I had two four-year-olds at the time. So it wasn't technically bored because I was really, really busy, but just that mental, that feeling of just, I don't even know if boredom is the right word. I, I do say all the time, it's totally possible to be busy and bored. And that happens for mothers a lot. And it happened for me, but mm -hmm. it, it might've been more than boredom. It might've just been a recognition that something was missing that maybe had been being fulfilled by that previous career, even though it wasn't the right career for me. And I had to figure out how to find it. And I think it took me almost 15 years after that to get back to a place where it felt like, oh yeah, no, I'm really proud of myself. I'm doing the things I want to be doing. This feels like resonant and, you know, right. So I yeah. just, I've been just like noodling this question with you. Cause I'm thinking, wow, how do you come off of the incredible success that you had in your career with kayaking? How do you come off of that and kind of reset and start again? What was that experience like for you? When, first of all, when did that happen in your life? Like when was the moment where you realized, okay, I'm probably done with the competitive side of the sport and yeah. how did that feel? And, and what did that lead to for you? Yeah. And thank you for such a meaningful question, Wendy. It's, it really is, um, and was the most, uh, difficult time in my life so far. Um, career transition, whether it be sport or professional career, um, I think it's, it's, it's an experience that everyone will move through eventually. Uh, it's, it's a scary time. For me, um, I found retirement, and we call it in our sport world, but right there wrong, we call it retirement from sport. Um, even though I'm still, I still consider myself an athlete at heart. Um, but that retirement piece for me, it was so tough. I, I actually did it twice. And, uh, so the first time I retired, I decided to come back, you know, two months later and got back into the training and got back into the group and, and things like that. And then competed actually for another year and a half um, following that. But when I finally decided to hang up the paddle, it was the most challenging time in my life and, and uh, the, the lowest point so far um, in that journey. And I went through three I was experiencing three big things all at once. So leaving my sport, leaving, you know, everything, everyone I knew, um, in that sense, I also was going through, um, my second, uh, disc hernia. So I had a little back injury. So I was in physical pain. Um, and I couldn't do my normal, um, self-regulation things. I use sport and movement as a way to, manage my emotions and, and manage my mental health and my well-being and, and I wasn't able to do those things so I was I found myself like literally flat on the couch um, the third and probably most stressful piece in all of that I was moving through 
uh, separation and divorce from my partner, my husband at the time. Um, so three major life pieces all at once. Wendy, there were moments where I couldn't get up in the morning. I couldn't do the things that I wanted to do. I didn't feel like myself for days, weeks. Um, and what I relied on in that time was, you know, getting back to those meaningful routines for me. And I call them resilience routines that helped me as an athlete get into the mindset of, and I wasn't anywhere close to thinking about performance at that time. I was just thinking about moving from point A to point B, going into, you know, having a shower, preparing my lunch, having a healthy sleep routine and things like that. So routines that were meaningful to me as an athlete came back in those moments. And I really leaned into them hard. Um, I relied on my family, my friends, uh, to connect to, um, and, you know, communicate with. And luckily I've always felt supported by my friends and family and, and have that good network that I can, uh, openly and honestly talk with. Um, so that was really helpful for me, but yeah, it was finding a way back and all at the same time I was running my business. So my business is called, I promise performance. I couldn't even promise you that I wasn't going to burst into tears on right. stage and in a public facing speaking role where I had to engage an audience. And it was the most difficult thing to do, to just put one foot in front of the other. And um, I don't know how I got through that time, but I did. Um, it was incredibly, incredibly hard. Uh, but I knew that speaking and particularly speaking with youth brought me presence it brought me joy it brought me purpose and i felt like i was moving through those you know difficult emotions through doing that work mm. so uh yeah getting into a different you know how was i going to show up in the world how who was karen going to be off the start line yeah. um it yeah. was a really tricky transition and it probably took me you know a year two years almost uh, that I was okay with that. Um, but yeah, the things that I, I, once I was healthy and able, I was, I was, you know, getting back to my movement, my workouts, that was incredibly important and helpful for me to move my body, help to move the emotional energy as well through my mind and, you know, what I was processing. Um, but yeah, in that time, I stayed pretty clear away from kayaking and that, and my club and my teammates and you know, it was, it wasn't that I didn't feel welcome and, and open around them. I just didn't want to be doing that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was a, it was a very strange time. That's so um, interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. So honestly, because I think as you know, you're grappling with this question at this time in your life of like, who am I, if I'm not a world champion, who am I, if I'm not an Olympian, who am I, if I'm, you know, if I'm not this, this ultra competitive athlete, yeah. And the way that you go about working your way through the grief and finding some clarity on that question is not different, any different really than any other human being who's grappling with, you know, the questions that I hear all the time in my coaching practice that the successful women I work with are struggling with are things like, who am I if I'm no longer a mother? So, so many of my, my clients are at exactly the same life stage as me and our kids are about to leave for university. And we're like, oh my God, <laughs> like what happens uh, now? This has been such a big piece of like what I see as my identity and who am I if I'm not this, or who am I if I'm no longer a lawyer or who am I if I'm, you know, no longer a wife, if you're going through a, a separation mm -hmm. or divorce, yeah. um, or if you're, if you're widow, if you're widowed, um, yeah. And I think it's so interesting that you highlighted those pieces that are this, you know, very similar to the same things I talk to my clients about in terms of how to get through tough stuff like that. Number one sounds to me like you focus back in on those pillars of wellness. So what are these key things that were so important in keeping me kind of not just in peak performance shape, but just, just strong and balanced as a human being mentally and physically. And how can I start with the basics of those again, building those putting those pieces in place for that, for that resiliency. And then the importance of routine, which is yeah. just so underestimated. And I know now you do a lot of work around mental health and you work with the kid, the kids help, uh, helpline. Um, yeah. 
But that really simple step of going back and saying like, when I had a routine, <laughs> what did it look like? Yeah. And how can I try to recreate even the most basic of routines when I'm feeling as low as I'm feeling like just at nine o'clock, I get out of bed and I make a cup of coffee. And at 11 o'clock, I, you know, go for a walk. And at 12 o'clock, I make a sandwich and yeah. at two o'clock. I call my mother, <laughs> you know, yes. setting that up. I think that's so great. And then the other thing that you highlighted is also something that I'm just such a, a big believer in, in terms of its power, which is the power of connection and just making sure that you were reconnecting with family and friends and you had some support there yeah. in place. And, you know, I can even see all of this as, you know, uh, the other question I hear all the time because of the work I do is who am I, if I'm not a drinker? Um, yes. and that's a, it's a tough one for women to reconcile with when you've always been the person who was fun and, you know, hosted the, the host of all the best parties and all the rest of it. Like, who are you, if you're not that? And I think this is a really great roadmap for anybody who is going through a transition, whether it's a, like you said, a career transition or it's a family transition or, um, or a behavioral transition, like giving up alcohol. Um, so thanks for sharing all that. That's, that's great. I knew, I knew we'd be on the same page with this stuff. Um, okay. So I want to talk about, um, goal setting, because this is something that I talk about a lot as well, uh, mm -hmm. as a coach. And I'm really curious to know, from someone who's obviously had incredible success in setting personal goals and achieving them. What do you think are some of the key components to doing that in an effective way where it's actually achievable. I just, I see all the time and I I'm guilty of this myself, right. We'll set goals that are, you know, just way too big and overwhelming. And we also have goals based on oftentimes based on behavioral steps. And if we screw up one of those behavioral steps, then there's no way to succeed right now we're screwed. And so, um, you know, I, I'm just curious what your philosophy and approach is to setting goals, whether you're, you're thinking about where you were when you were still ultra in that, that ultra competitive world or, or now as a business person. Yeah, thanks. Um, absolutely. And it's, I mean, I grew up, uh, kind of in that goal setting mindset and, you know, achieving, whether it be, um, you know, time, time achievements on a, in a sport world or, you know, a certain performance level to make a specific team. Um, but for me, I think the most important thing and the most important step that people kind of forget about is, are these goals in alignment with who you want to be? Is like, so getting back to that check-in piece around how do you want to feel? How do you want to show up? Um, not, not even just what do you want to achieve because that's, right. that's kind of pie in the sky and it's not really, doesn't have a lot of feeling connected to it necessarily, but, um, the feeling pieces and the values pieces, I think are so important in terms of whether or not we can be, have that success feeling around goal setting too. Right. And, and adherence, um, sticking with that goal. And for me, it was all around that checking, that checking in and continuously checking in or, and I was totally, you know, I had to learn the process of letting go of a goal as well, because some goals just kind of fizzle out or we're not in alignment anymore, or they, things have changed, situations have changed maybe. Um, and so that re coming back and not holding any, you know, sense of failure or sense of, um, you know, not accomplishing it's, it's a, it's a, a peaceful parting almost of a, of a goal and, and letting it go too. Uh, I had to learn how to do that. And, um, and so I think it's, it, you know, really important to check in with, with values and how we want to be and move through the world. Um, and I, I don't think I, like, I have a little framework, but I don't, you know, rely on it a ton. It's really, um, you know, is this, is this something that I want to be doing? If that's a, a yes, um, you know, from all parts, then I, I go forward and I go forth. And, and it is about breaking it into smaller steps because let's face it, the, the big audacious goal is, is sometimes, you know, disheartening. Like, it's like, oh my gosh, well, where do you even start? Well, mm. you start at the very beginning and that's, mm -hmm. you know, kind of where we are and, and, you know, move, move up the steps and, and sometimes take a step back and recircle around, take a new route. Um, right. You know, all of those kind of things that we talk about with 
uh, goal setting and overcoming challenge and, and things like that. So, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not linear. It never is. I don't think it's very messy in parts. I think it's, you know, it, it doesn't always or probably ever show up as we intend it to. Um, and sometimes it takes a whole lot longer as well. And that's one of the messages that I share with uh, youth today is that we, we live in such an immediate um, society and we want the results yesterday. Well, it takes a long, long time to get to that place of, okay, now I feel like I'm accomplishing and on the path of, yeah, I'm really close to that goal. Um, like years, years, right. years. And, and it's a, it's a process. And, you know, as we grow through those goals, we also learn, and this I think is the real golden nugget and, and the true value of that goal is we learn about ourselves and, and, um, how we're going to take that next step, however it shows up. Yeah. I love that. I, I totally agree with everything you said in the context that I work in. Um, mm -hmm. I love the idea that you, can hold a goal loosely, mm -hmm. um, and that you can change a goal and that's okay. In fact, that's oftentimes the only way you achieve your potential is by yeah, letting yeah. go of things that aren't working for you. And that, you know, I talk a lot about this idea of just really life, just being an experiment where you're just figuring out. And the only way to figure things out is to try things and see how they go and learn what you learn from the, those things. And, and then use that information to set yourself up for greater success as you move forward. So that that's all really, um, I love that. really, really helpful, I think. And, you know, the truth is we don't do things if they don't feel good. So if we're trying to accomplish something and the goal is overwhelming and feels impossible, first of all, we also know our brain, there needs to be buy-in from our brain in order for our body to follow. So if there's no degree of possibility in whatever this goal is that we set for ourselves, um, it's really difficult to actually take the action steps required to get closer to it. So making sure that whatever goal you set is something that, that feels you know, challenging, but still doable. Like there's some degree of possibility in it, I think is really critical as well. And then, and then building off of that as you go. Yeah. Um, okay. So, oh my gosh, Karen, so much to talk about. I'm kind of like all over the <laughs> place here. Um, so when you're, so you're working with, when you're working with, uh, groups, you work with adult groups and groups of youth in terms of Yes. presenting and speaking. Yeah. So if you were talking to a corporate group about mindset and, uh, performance and the connection between, I assume you talk about the connection between health and performance and health and mindset and performance. What yes. are some of the key, what are some of the key messages that you try to drive home in those presentations around the connections between those three things? Yeah, and I I really believe that mindset, health, and performance are interlinked. Um, and the message that I try to convey uh, with those audiences, whether it be youth or corporate, um, is that you know there's there's a process in place where you know we don't just although sometimes we seem to find ourselves in these moments and expect okay now I'm ready to go I've I've got to go well if we prepare and spend time and effort and wait in that value of preparation and kind of honoring that preparation process, uh, then we can bring the mindset online with the body and the energy and produce performance in a more effective way. And likewise, one of the most valuable lessons that I learned through sport is the value of um, coming down from that performance, the value of self-care, healing, rest, recovery, so overlooked. You know, we kind of jump from one task to the other as, as a, a, a general group these days, but it's, it, it does take its toll if we, you know, perform at a, long, at a high rate of energy output for a long period of time. And that's, I think, what we're seeing with these high, high levels of fatigue and burnout and, and you know, just... Um, just, uh, you know, general malaise and, and not feeling well and connected. So getting back to, you know, the sport world for me and trying to convey all of those great nuggets, those golden tools that I learned um, about the value of preparation. So warm up, you know, getting the, the mind ready, getting the body ready, 
And I do this in speaking now too. Like it's, it's skills that I learned as an athlete, but I still very much use today. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, what, all of the things that we allow and get, um, uh, give to our body in terms of what we consume, how we feed ourselves, what we're reading online just ahead of an important meeting or something like that, right? It, it definitely affects our energy and, and our ability to connect with people. So for me, I'm very, very aware. Um, in fact, I have a rule when I do a performance, which is like call that speaking, now, um, I don't, I'm not on social media ahead of that, like for like hours ahead of that. I don't look at emails um, because I, you know, obviously if there's someone from the client that needs to reach me, I'm tuned into that. But I generally really go into this zone where I deeply connect and try to align with the, you know, the messages that I want to send to this particular group and, and, and how I want to do that. And then I, you know, I also prepare my body. I move, I do a workout, um, you know, ahead of that. And then I, I actually do these movements where I expand my chest. Like you, we tend to sit like this, like we hold mm -hmm. in protection mode where we're, we close off our chest and we crunch up our neck and our shoulders. Well, as an athlete on the start line, I had to open my chest. In fact, I would punch the, the air with my paddle to bring about that fierce, energy of connection. And, mm -hmm. and that for me is almost a, a ritual that I, that I do ahead of a performance. So not that those particular things apply, but there's, I think the, what I'm trying to say is that the value is in that preparation. If we prepare to do a performance, then we're going to perform in a more connected way. Right. And then super important to, to rest, recover, debrief, um, assess feedback and, and things like that, right. To take that, those learning pieces out of that performance too. Yeah. Such a good analogy just for any, for anything that might fall under that sort of, perf I'm putting it in air quotes, that performance umbrella, any, yeah. any task or, uh, you know, milestone that we're achieving or, thing that we're about to do. I love that idea. And so the, the preparation is really the part we were talking about earlier. It's that idea of like making sure that you're practicing all of the things, all of the time that make you feel good and that keep you physically and mentally well. And then you can also do obviously some, some specific preparation right before the event that can help. And I, we, yeah. in the coaching world, we call that getting in state, which I do all the time, yes. right? Play, like play the music, clear my mind, clean my yeah. desk off if I'm doing something important and just kind of get myself in that zone and clear out all the other stuff. And then, yes. and then you do, you have do your performance and it's so, so important. This is the part I love the most about what you said really is the recovery afterwards and giving and recognizing we, we, you know, as a competitive athlete, that's like non-negotiable that yeah. you're going to do that. That's, it's just, it's part of your schedule. You recognize the value of it. It happens every single time you would never skip the recovery, but yeah. we skip the recovery constantly, yeah. you know, yeah. in life. And that is absolutely what leads to the burnout that I see. It's certainly the burnout I saw myself, um, yeah. when I was still practicing law and the burnout, even the burnout, I had kind of a secondary burnout after my dad died. Um, because I wasn't, there was no recovery happening in that time period either. I was just getting through, getting yeah. through the days. So I love that you're emphasizing the importance of coming down that recovery, getting the feedback from your own body, but also anybody else who was involved in the experience and, you know, learning from that. And then, you know, waiting, I guess, until you're ready to, to do it again, once you've recovered yeah. such a great, let me just kind of be clear. Sorry to jump in yeah, there go ahead. Um, to make it doable. Cause it's, you know, the recovery piece as an athlete, you know, you spend half an hour doing a cool down paddle and you're stretching and you're rolling and all that good stuff. Um, yeah. But in real world, like I'm talking about taking a breath, taking a pause, yeah. decompressing, right? So just those pieces that we can do immediately to mm -hmm. recenter and give that little wash of healing through the mm -hmm. mind and the body, just to kind of get back on, you know, into the next, next task or to go into a deeper recovery or, or, you know, piece of <laughs> relaxation maybe. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, definitely take time, um, to just pause, just have, even if it's 10 seconds, like there's, there's time to breathe, uh, take it. 
take a drink of water, reconsume that water, you know, hydrate the body, um, yeah. all of those pieces to take a breath going outdoors, getting into fresh air, perhaps. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. So many little, so just to say, it doesn't need to be this whole huge long yeah. recovery routine, but it's, we need to emphasize that value in. Uh, yeah. We have to close the stress cycle. So we're yeah. coming from, you know, acute fight or flight in that situation. We need to pull ourselves back into the relaxation response. And we talk a lot about that on this podcast. And there's so many simple ways to do that, including changing your, you know, being deliberate about your pattern of breath, but yeah. um, that's so, so, so important. And I do think it's really important to consider too, you know, if this is a one-off event that you've been preparing for, and it's a short thing, and you know, you went into acute st stress for, you know, 40 minutes while you were doing it and now it's over. That's one thing. But if you've been in a period of chronic intense stress, so, you know, you've had three, four months before, you know, uh, for all the people I know work in the financial industry or in business, you know, before year, year end, end like right, now. <laughs> right before yeah. year end or in tax season or whatever. And yeah. it's just the most intensely difficult, challenging time for you, or maybe it's teachers at the end of the year or, yeah. you know, whatever it is. If, if for me, it's January, it's all the January resolutions in September when people are all ready to go, you know, those are always my busiest months when yeah. you're coming off of those things. You remember like there's, uh, it, I think there's a real benefit to looking at your life in seasons and recognizing that there's a time for, you know, for going bananas and getting the work done and, you know, maybe yeah. taking a little less care of yourself. But if you're going to do that, you need to take the rest afterwards. And it does yeah. need to be more of a season, you know, and you need to get better at recognizing when you're going through one of those and then planning for the recovery and rest afterwards. So yeah, I totally agree with you. It could be just a short, like a, a small scale recovery you know, deliberate action that pulls you out of fight or flight, calms you back down and kind of regulates yeah. your nervous system. Or it can be like, I actually need a break here because I right. have just been off of this period of like intense stress and elevated cortisol for a long time, whether again, that's a business thing or it's taking care of somebody who's been really, really sick or whatever. Um, so I think, yeah, all of that is so great. And I love that analogy that just so easily kind of translates from um, sport into um, into life. So great. In typical, um, Wendy style, I've lost your notes, but I found them again. So it's all good. <laughs> also, I felt like you were, when you were talking about the being crunched over at your desk and I was like looking at myself on the screen, I'm like, she's totally talking to me. I do. I do have my, <laughs> I am leaning, I'm leaning on something right now. So it looks probably, yeah. wrong, but I'm mm -hmm. so guilty of that. And I, I actually, that's one of my things that I'm trying to work on is just getting better at noticing my posture and actually trying to sit up straighter. Cause I am just as bad at that as everybody else is. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. So I had a couple more kind of more specific things I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah, one was, yeah. I really wanted to just take a minute to kind of talk about that post that I, the post I posted, I think on Instagram, yeah. um, in, which if you're not following me on Instagram, I always forget to tell people where I am. So it's at beat burnout and booze on Instagram. And I think I posted, I don't remember the exact post, but it was something about like the presence of alcohol in the wellness industry and how it really wasn't the right place for alcohol to be and how normalized it had become to have alcohol, you know, present at sports activities and wellness in wellness spaces. And, um, and I don't know if I talked about kids sporting events or not, but that's an area I'm quite passionate about as well. Like alcohol in relation yes. to kids, kids sports stuff. Yeah. And you and I were chatting before, before the podcast and you were telling me about the Olympics, the in Beijing, <laughs> Beijing, can you, so, cause I asked you like, what's the scoop with the Olympics and booze? Yeah. Like, is it a, is there, you know, a, a big presence? And, and you told me this little story about, um, one particular yeah. story that I thought was really kind of very interesting and telling. Yeah, so in my last Olympic Games, which was Beijing uh, 2008, um, we were alerted. So we were in prep uh, phase uh, two weeks out of the Games. And while we were training in China, uh, the uh, Chinese government uh, or you know, their, their powers that be closed all of the factories except the beer factories. And the reason being is that the, to get rid of the smog in the city for the venues and for the, the broadcast, the Olympic broadcast for all the networks and the, worlds to, the world to see. Um, so, so much so that where we were paddling, we didn't see, there was so much smog 
um, produced by all the factories that we did not see the mountains um, until two days ahead of our, the, the opening of the Olympic Games. Um, and then there was all of a sudden mountains there that were visible and these beautiful, you know, snow capped mountains were all of a sudden there. And it was just, a, it was, it was an eye opening experience for me. But the, the funny piece in all that was that they chose to keep the beer factories going because the world was coming to Beijing and they were paying big money to access Olympic venues and, and, and things like that. And they wanted you know, to host, uh, obviously. But uh, yeah, it's, it wasn't super visible other than that to me, but that's, that was a pretty big thing that you know, yeah. they, they took that stand. I think it's just so, I mean, there's, I'm, we're not here to be judgy or preachy or any of that. Like, I mean, I think everyone who listens to this, to this podcast knows that for years and years and years, I drank way more than I should. And I also was guilty of like sharing the, you know, unhelpful memes about drinking and I did all of it. So this isn't meant to be judgy or preachy, but since I've gotten into the space that I'm in now, and I think probably you're, you know, also there, but for different reasons, mm-hmm. um, it's just become so blatant to me how insidious the role of alcohol in sports and wellness is and just you know the sponsorships and the presence at these big events and it just feels so incongruent to me it feels so jarring and I remember you know before I stopped drinking especially in the last couple years where I was really starting to question whether I was drinking too much I felt very fraudulent and um, disingenuine, uh, talking to anybody about their drinking. And I definitely was never, I've never been the wellness person who's been pumping alcohol and, you know, which is the part that really makes me upset is the suggestion that somehow it is, that alcohol somehow is health, healthy in balance. Um, and, you know, uh, d- d- like the misinformation around, uh, and the, f- any suggestion that it has any positive health benefits. That's not something I ever did. I would never share those things because a piece of me always felt like that could not possibly be true. Like a deep down, I always knew that wasn't the case, but it wasn't until I stopped drinking and got into this, you know, world that I'm in now that it just became so obvious to me how much influence and power alcohol has and how deliberate that choice is to be in the wellness and sports world. And so I think it's just the most important thing is for us to just start getting mindful around it and thinking about it and getting aware and questioning it. Like, does wine really belong in the yoga studio? Does it, you know, does beer really belong at, um, in my kids ho- in my kids at my kids hockey game or whatever it is? Um, yeah. does this really make sense? And, um, you know, for me, it's really the, the biggest concern I have is again, about the message that gets sent with this. Sometimes the messaging is that somehow this is healthy when listen, you, you're a consenting adult with free will, and you get to decide for yourself what you choose to do and not do. And we all choose to take some risks. Um, but what I am not okay with is somebody sending out a deliberate a deliberately misleading message that suggests that somehow this is healthy. Cause I think it is very, very clear now that there is, there are zero health benefits when it comes to alcohol. So what are your thoughts on that? After I went on my, I just went on a big like monologue there. I apologize, but no, Wendy, thank you. And, and first of all, you know, thank you so much for using your platform to have this conversation. I think it's so needed and so important. And hence, you know, I've always followed you uh, since I've, become aware of you in, in the you know, social media world and what you're doing. Um, and that's, you know, kind of why I reached out when I did to you and, you know, kind of applauded you for, for standing and saying what you did. And I think it's, it's really important to, as you say, be aware, just be mindful um, and, and notice, you know, notice how, how does that sit with you? Are you okay with that? And not again, not judging, but how do we want to be moving through our world? What do we want? What message do we want to be, you know, showing our youth um, and and other communities what's okay? And and from a from a value standpoint, and and always that checking in, I think, is really important. Um, for me, I'm in agreement with you. I you know I don't think there's a, a place to host um, and and have alcohol available at, in the health and wellness spaces. 
Uh, I don't think it's uh, supportive or helpful, and I don't think it sends a healthy message. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's you know kind of how I live my life, and and try to you know align with organizations that have similar uh, beliefs and and values as well. Um, yeah, in, in an important important conversation, and we're seeing it more and more. You know, the fight for sponsorship dollars is is real for these different events and spaces and and uh, organizations and things like that. And the alcohol industry and not just the alcohol industry, all industries, they want to be visible and they want to be prominent and they want to be seen. You know, the, there's been a definite shift in marketing of alcohol. Um, and yes. you know, they, they've taken on this role of, um, you know, having these healthy, active personas kind of putting their brand forward. And I think that that has you know that has shifted a little bit from the marketing that I grew up with, which was very different, and and in in other ways which we won't get into right now. But yeah. but lots of you know shifts in how the marketing and you know marketing marketers are really smart, like they're they're on the ball, but they and they know that you know there's a big community of people who are moving into okay, I want to live a healthy and active lifestyle. Well. Let's get our brand there, right? So it's yeah. Let's drink the carbohydrate-free beer because that's somehow yeah. less toxic, and let's you know um, drink the lower calorie, uh, you know, artificially sweetened whatever their seltzer waters, uh, hard seltzers, because those are somehow. <clears throat> healthier for me. So <clears throat> that marketing drives me bananas, but I yeah. will say this. I don't know if you watch, you probably don't, uh, you probably don't have enough time on your hands to watch this, but I've been watching formula one on Netflix. Oh, I've heard of that. I'm, I haven't seen it. Oh my gosh. I'm addicted to it. Now I know way more about formula one racing than I ever thought or uh, I would <laughs> want or wanted to know. But what I've noticed in form in the formula one racing, which is of course, like an incredibly lucrative you know, sport and just, it's so much money involved, um, in that sport, um, was that Heineken zero is one of the primary sponsors and they're always on the track. So that's all you see is the 0% alcohol yeah. beer as, um, it's on. So anyone who's watching formula one, look out for that and you're going to see it there everywhere. And I don't uh-huh. see other, you know, you see the champ, they always, you know, shake the champagne on the yeah. championship stage and spray it all over and drink out of the bottle and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the main alcohol that I see there now is a non-alcoholic beer, which I think is awesome. And, you know, of course we know that the biggest growing segment of the drinks industry is the non-alcoholic adult drink industry, which is really cool. So hopefully this will start to shift, but um, I did just want to have a quick conversation with you about that because you are, you know, such an exceptional athlete and, um, and you did comment on that post. So I just wanted your, your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the last thing, Karen, that I really want to make sure we talk about is your new, this new role that you told me about just before we started, um, that you are starting next week. I think that you're really excited about, you want to tell everybody what that is? Of course. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to be starting with the YWCA, which I'm really excited to be joining that team. And my role will be in sport and inclusion. It's a, it's a sport inclusion lead role. And uh, so focusing primarily on getting uh, young females and gender diverse individuals involved in sport and activity post COVID-19. So that's been identified as a huge need. Um, The dropout rate of young females is like one in four um, that aren't coming back into sport. And that's from the age group of like 10 to 18. So, you know, those foundational years and, uh, and, uh, and having that, you know, sport, uh, an activity be safe space uh, that's inclusive and you know diverse and equitable and just all of those good things and pieces that I'm passionate about and I'm yeah really excited to work with you know a collaboration um, with lots of different organizations that are kind of putting this role in place in, in many different ways it's a brand new role um, uh, and it's a space I think that we're going to see more and more hopefully. Mm-hmm. Uh, around in our, our youth organizations, but organizations in general. Yeah, it's so great. And I hadn't really thought about it. I mean, we had our own experience around sport with my daughter during um, COVID and 
and she was 16, I think when COVID started 16, 15, maybe when COVID started and was just like kind of peaking, she was a competitive rhythmic gymnast. And she was just sort of at that place where she had all these goals that she'd set for herself since she was four, um, around what she wanted to do in those last couple of years, because that's a sport where you really do kind of age out early. Um, and you know, she, she had a goal of getting into the national stream when she was, uh, basically like 16, 17. And, um, and then COVID happened and there was, there were no practices and then worst, then they were practicing at home and they did their best. I mean, they just, the gym was just amazing in terms of trying to support the athletes, but you know, it was boring and she was training at home on a carpeted floor instead of in the huge space she was supposed to be in. And she couldn't practice any of the stuff like the throws and all of the things that she, you know, so it was a very different experience for her. And then the biggest piece for her is that she is a performer. She is a born performer and there was no performing. And so they were all, every single competition was canceled. It was the most depressing year for her. And she stuck with it. She stuck with it and did it straight through the year. And then by the time she entered grade 12, she, this year, she just said, I can't, mom, like, why am I doing this? And there, you know, so it was a really good example of that, how COVID impacted her. And that was her, was her thing. And so finding something else, I mean, I guess she's privileged in that, first of all, she's privileged. So she's, you know, a privileged kid with enough, with the means and, you know, the resources and whatever the support to, to Mm -hmm. have somebody at home who can say to her, like, you have got to replace this with something else, which I did. And, you know, she goes to the gym with me now, but, um, I can just see how that must have just had, it must have just been across the board that, I mean, boys were impacted too. My daughter, my son's a basketball player. He, his seasons all got screwed up with junior varsity and all the rest of it. But I think it's different with girls because, you know, I I was telling you earlier that I'd had Lindsay, Lindsay Doyle on this podcast last season, and she's Mm -hmm. a local photographer who put together a really beautiful book about women in sport. And we were talking about, again, it's the same topic, like why girls leave sport so young and how we get women and back into sport. Um, and, uh, I guess I just, I guess what I'm thinking is that there's, there must've been just this widespread, like deep hit for women and girls during, during the pandemic. So, yeah. And uh, like, I think that stat is one in seven boys at that similar age group is not interesting um, and one in four for girls. So it's Mm -hmm. very much a need Mm -hmm. Um, and for various reasons and lots of them you've alluded to Wendy, you know, financial, obviously um, access, but also confidence you know these these yeah. young, young females they they all of a sudden lost their their sense of self their sense of purpose and their confidence in their skills like you you just mentioned and i think you know girls are in sport for very different reasons from per, perhaps than boys and we're just starting to kind of get at that get at those reasons and and address them uh, from many different areas but i think yeah that's one of the main reasons why, you know, we're going to see a whole generation here of young females that have not had the opportunities that sport and activity uh, can provide and, and all of those life skills. And I, and I don't mean to say just sport in general, it's, it's goals, right? Like performances. If you look at the performing arts, similarly, they mm. were all shut down. So if, yes. it's, you know, yeah. if youth is passionate, no matter yeah. what the goal they've been affected through this whole time. So it's, I think it's a really, really important conversation. Um, and I know that youth, uh, you know, uh, there's lots of, uh, the, on the mental health side too, that we're just seeing data on in our region um, where they're, you know, they're, they're, they're continuing to struggle through this, this time of even the reopening and that process and, and what that looks like. So uh, important conversation, I'm excited to be, part of that and kind of, you know, getting into a, a new role, but a, a, a familiar space, I think when it's you know, talking about sport. Yeah. So, so important. So, so important. And we didn't even talk about, you know, inclusion of transgender kids and mm-hmm. yep. all the rest of it. Just so, so such an important, um, such an important, uh, initiative. Um, so that's really exciting. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank so, you. I mean, this has just been such a great conversation. I know you're a busy person. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I do want to say 
um, thank you so much for giving me the time today um, and talking so candidly about your own experiences. I want to make sure that we let people know where they can get in touch with you. So you're still doing, you're actively doing the corporate speaking, your YM, am. Y, your YWCA job is a, is, a, is happening in parallel to your, yes, yes. To your speaking gig. So if there's someone listening who's interested in having you come speak to either their um, youth group or their corporate group, how do they find you, Karen? Yeah, so my business website is ipromiseperformance.com. Um, yeah, my all of my contact info is there. The social Perfect. media handles is there are there as well. Um, but yeah, ipromiseperformance.com. Reach out, please. I would love to connect to your youth group or or, or a corporate organization on the, on that whole resilience theme and moving through or goal goal setting, um, getting the best out of ourselves. I think is you know it's a it's a tricky tricky subject, but I think it's it's a it's yeah. well worth the gold. Uh, well, you you know that you can speak to that better than anyone else. So. Um... And thank you for sharing all of your wisdom and experience with us today and for being so honest. It's so great. It's always so great to talk to somebody who, you know, uh, has a bit of a celebrity status and who has accomplished, oh <laughs> accomplished some pretty incredible things um, and uh, who is willing to share the, you know, the the tougher, more real moments of that whole process. So I really, really appreciate that, Karen. Thank you so much. It's been so lovely talking to you. And uh, maybe I'll have you back once you've had some time in this role and we can talk more about girls in sport. Yes, I would love that. Thank you so much, Wendy. And thanks everyone for listening in. Bye everyone. Are you drinking more than you'd like, but finding it hard to cut back? I've got some great news. My popular five-day rewind challenge is starting again very soon. This five-day challenge is the circuit breaker you've been looking for to start making alcohol small and irrelevant in your life. Join us and learn a little more about why you drink and what life might be like if you drank a little less. Whether this is the first time you've gotten curious about alcohol or something you've been struggling with for years, this no-strings, completely free challenge is for you. Join us every day for five days to learn the game-changing mindset shifts to drinking less without feeling deprived. Recorded replays are available to registered participants only. Get the details and register now at wendymccallum.com forward slash challenge. That's W-E-N-D-Y-M-C-C-A-L-L-U-M dot com forward slash challenge.